Yes guys, welcome back to the Premier League Appetizers show on the Asian one to one football coaching channel. I'm Coach Indy. We're on episode two today and on today's episode we're going to be talking about all the results from Project Restart, so the first round of fixtures and the two um, games that were missed from the League Cup final. So effectively 12 games that we were talking about. Then we're going to be sort of looking forward to game week 31 plus um, and also just we're talking about a couple of topics that um, UEFA have announced sort of throughout the last sort of five days or so. Before we get stuck into that, if you haven't subscribed to the channel already, hit the subscribe button, leave a like, and leave a comment as well with um, what you thought about the Project Restart, first round of games, what games you liked, what teams you liked, what teams you thought, oh, they didn't do too well, um, they could be in trouble. Leave a comment, guys, and uh, we'll get back to you. Okay, uh, before we get stuck into game week 30+, plus, I just want to go through a couple of things that UEFA have announced with regards to European competitions. So, the Champions League has been announced that it'll be a 12 day mini tournament played in Lisbon at two different stadiums. Forgive my pronunciation here, the two stadiums' names are Estadio de Luz and Estadio Jose Alvaleda. I believe I pronounced that correctly, don't hold me to it. Um, so, yeah, the games will be played there. The tournament will start on the 12th of August and finish on the 23rd of August, so effectively sort of 11 days. Um, Quarterfinals will take place on the 12th, 12th to the 15th of August, semi-finals 18th and the 19th of August, and then the final on the 23rd of August. Now, some of you might be asking what's happening with the last 16 games, second leg matches. So if you cast your minds back, um, Manchester City haven't played their second leg against Real Madrid, and Chelsea haven't played their second leg against uh, Bayern Munich. So those dates have been penciled in for the 7th and 8th of August, so effectively five or four days prior to this mini tournament. So those ties will get concluded, then you'll roll into the quarters, semis and the finals, and then by the 20, 23rd of August, we'll have a Champions League winner. Uh, <clears throat> and then Europa League, a very sort of similar format, but the competition will be held in a different country. So it'll be held in Germany, with the final to be taking place in Cologne. I believe... Um, the stadiums that will be taking place, I believe there's four different stadiums, I don't know the four. Um, if any of you guys do know, drop us a little comment, let us know which ones they are. So, the remaining last 16 games, second leg ties will be played on the 5th and 6th of August, so very similar to sort of the Champions League that we played prior to sort of the mini tournament. And then, there's also two games that we played as single leg matches with a venue yet to be confirmed. So. There's a couple of games, if you if you sort of remember back, there's a couple of games that got cancelled before their first legs. So effectively UEFA have said that those those matches, I think Inter Milan's tie is one of them, if remember says memory serves me right, they will effectively be played just as a single leg tie, but yet the, the venue's not been confirmed yet. So whether that'll be in a play at home or it just be played in somewhere in Germany or what or, or in or Inter's opposition stadium, I don't know, but it's yet to be confirmed. And then we roll on to the 12th, uh, so the 10th and 11th of August, that's when the quarterfinals will take place. Then fast forward into the 16th and 17th of August, that's when the semis will be played. And then over to the 21st, which is the final will be played in Cologne. So the 21st of August we'll have um, a Europa League winner, and then two days later on we'll have a Champions League winner. So all the UEFA um, competitions will get finished, um, will be obviously in strange circumstances and a very different sort of format with the second. Um, second phase of the, the competitions in a different sort of format, but at least they're going to get completed, and that's a an absolute positive. Okay, just um, I'm just going to have a recap of um, game week 30 plus. So obviously Premier League is back, and I expressed my feelings about this on the last episode. Absolutely delighted it's back, and I'm sure everyone across the globe is absolutely buzzing that Premier League's back. Um, we'll just run through a load of the games and some of the sort of thing, maybe the key sort of moments in the games um, and some of the goal scores as well. Okay, so cast, back, cast your minds back to 17th of June, which there was two games played. One was early kickoff, which was Aston Villa versus Sheffield United. Game finished nil nil. wasn't the wasn't the goal fest that maybe some were expecting. Um, although the main talking point was the, the goal was the goal. So VAR, oh sorry, not VAR, goal line technology didn't pick up um, Oliver Norwood's cross um, being sort of not bundled, but. Goalkeeper for Aston Villa, I think his name is Niland, caught the ball and sort of 
went back into his goal and was into the side net and the ball was definitely over the line. But the cameras, I think seven or eight cameras, didn't see it because of various obstructions, whether it be bodies, goal posts, um, all that kind of thing. They just didn't pick it up. So that potentially could be costly for Sheffield United. It also could be... Um, well, Aston Villa could be quite grateful as well, you know, if they stay in the division by one point, then they'd absolutely be pleased. Then you've got the the later game on the on the Wednesday as well, Manchester City versus Arsenal. Um, you know, two sort of heavyweights if you like, so certainly Manchester City are heavyweights. Um, game finished three 0 to Manchester City. Raheem Sterling scores. I'm really happy for him to score, especially the stuff sort he's gone through the last sort of six months in particular. KDP. Um, he scored a penalty. He's continued in exactly the same sort of form um, pre-COVID as well. And then a young Phil Foden has gone off the bench and scored as well. So I'm really pleased for Foden. He scored. He is a um, going to be a hell of a player it's on the years to come. Um, then on the Thursday there was no Premier League game, so I think maybe <laughs> a lot of people probably needed a bit of a break on the Thursday night because you know not seeing any live football for well live Premier League football for three months, two games sort of come in one night, might need a night off and then we roll into Friday and then obviously over the weekend there's a hell of a lot more games. So going into the Friday, again there's an early game, Norwich versus Southampton. Game finish, Norwich 0, Southampton 3. A brilliant, brilliant result for, Man for Southampton, sorry. Goals from Danny Ings, again picked up from where he left um, pre-Covid. Um, Stuart Armstrong and Redmond scored, so 3 Three 0 really good result. A really, really bad result for Norwich. Um, then to the later game, Spurs versus Man United. Obviously, me myself being a Man United fan, looking for a W there, but wasn't to be. Having said that, I did say before the game and the, and the days leading up to the game, I'd 100% take a point. It keeps our unbeaten record intact. A way to a rival um, and someone who sort of will be fighting for us, fighting with us to get to the European positions. Um, so it sort of maintains our distance between the sort of, you know, Spurs and ourselves. So Bergwijn actually scored for Spurs, put them 1-0 up. And then Bruno Fernandes, he, again, he's in sort of um, immense form at the moment. He scored a penalty as well. So decent point for United, although you could argue maybe they could have won the game as well with the chances they created. OK, moving on to Saturday early kickoff. This is where... There was an absolute fe feast of football. Um, four games all on TV. So remember, all the games, all 92 games are going to be aired on TV. Various broadcasters have got the rights for those. So the early kickoff was Watford versus Leicester. Finished 1 1. And I think the main talking point about this game was the two, the two uh, goals, really. Immense, immense goals. So Ben Chilwell scored um, in the 90th minute. An absolute power driver of a driven sort of strike into the, the far bracket and put Leicester 1-0 up in the 90th minute. So they were thinking at that stage, yeah, a couple of minutes to hold on and we've picked up a W and that sort of cements their position in third third position. But no, um, Nigel Pearson side don't give up. They're fairly decent at home since the obviously he's taken over. And then, yeah, young Craig, I say young Craig Dawson, he's not very young anymore. Craig Dawson, who hadn't been playing pre-COVID and started this game, and he scored a bicycle kick in the 93rd minute from a sort of second phase of a corner. Really well taken strike, really good um, technique as well. So a decent point for Watford. Leicester will be a, a, you know, disappointed if you're 1-0 up with three minutes to go in a game. You expect to see that out. So decent there for Watford. Um, to the three o'clock game, so I'm just going to quickly note here, this is the first ever time that the Premier League, well, a Premier League game has been broadcasted live in the UK at three o'clock on a Saturday. So very much uncharted territory from the Premier League. Game was Brighton versus Arsenal. The game finished 2-1 to Brighton. A brilliant, brilliant result for Brighton. That sort of pushes them further away from the relegation zone, exactly what they would wanted. And then in terms of Arsenal, oh, well, the slim the slim chances they did have of Champions League positions have all been sort of all but, all but gone, really, if I'm totally honest. Goal scorers, so actually Pepe put Arsenal 1-0 up with about 22 minutes to go. Lewis Dunk equalised a little while afterwards. And then, literally, in the last minute of the game, Neil Mopai uh, scored the winner. And we'll go into more detail about sort of the key incidents in, in that game as, as we go further down. And we preview sort of the next round of games. Um, then to the 
evening game or the first evening game, West Ham versus Wolves. Um, West Ham nil, Wolves two. Wolves are really, really strong. They're like I said this in the last episode. They're a really, they were a dark horse amongst the pack, if you like, the, the chasing pack to sort of finish in the Champions League. And for them to pick up a W straight away, um, yeah, brilliant result. Jimenez and Neto were the goal scorers there. Then to the, the late game, I believe this was the first time that the BBC um, have aired a Premier League game live as well. So Bournemouth versus Palace, finished Bournemouth nil, Palace 2. Um, I'll get into Bournemouth too much, but I do worry for them. They do look like they lacked a bit of fight, if I'm totally honest. And, and they made Palace, certainly in the first half, look like, well, Barcelona in some respects. But the goals scored from... Um, forgive my pronunciation, the Palace skipper Milijovic, I believe that's correct, and then um, AU scored as well. And then on the Sunday, the first game on the Sunday afternoon was Newcastle versus Chef U. So this is Chef U's second game. Um, you expect probably a really low scoring game in this, and it, it wasn't really. It was one of the, the high scoring games of the sort of round of fixtures. Finished three 0 to Newcastle, an absolutely brilliant result for Steve Bruce of Newcastle. Um, goal scorers Saint Maximin, Matt Ritchie, and Joe Linton. And we'll come to Joe Linton a little bit later on. Um, probably why I'm wondering why I'm smiling, but um, we'll come to him a little bit later on. Then you had the second game on the Sunday, which was Aston Villa Chelsea. Villa second game, second home game versus Chelsea. Um, Courtney Hawes actually opened the score just before half time to put Villa one 0 up. Against the runner play, one went up at half time, and then um, Pulisic equalised so short, shortly after he sort of came on, and then um, Olivier Giroud, who started ahead of Abraham in this game, um, got the winner. So very, very good result for for Chelsea, sort of cements their position and fourth fourth in the table. <coughs> and then to the Merseyside derby, where <coughs> obviously everyone knows there's no fans about, but. You know the atmosphere would have been well, possibly better for Everton, possibly against them. I'm not sure. Depends on way you look at it. But the game actually finished nil nil, and um, so it delays sort of Liverpool's chance of winning um, at the earliest opportunity. Um, and obviously, it's a decent point for Everton as well. And actually, you could argue Everton definitely had the better chances, and maybe you could even deserve all three points. Nevertheless, the inevitable is going to happen with Liverpool. Um, they will win the league in the next one, two, three games, whenever it be. And then the last game, which was last night, um, Manchester City's second game against Burnley, who get to play. So game finished 5-0 to Manchester City. Goal scorers, Phil Bowden scored two, Riyad Mahrez scored two, and David Silva scored. Um, we'll get stuck into that a bit more further down the line when we're sort of previewing the next games. But overall, sort of as a, you know, the Premier League coming back, Project Restart, I was really, really pleased to see, well, every single game, if I'm totally honest, I, I pretty much watched every single game, well, parts of every single game, and, um, sorry about that, um, pretty much every every game, or parts of every game, and uh, yeah, just absolutely pleased for the Premier League to be back, and can't wait for the next round of fixtures. That leads me to, straight into game week 31, 31 plus, should I say, um, so yeah, what we'll do is we'll, we'll preview every single game, sort of give you a bit of information on um, how their previous game went and maybe something that might happen or players that might be back or what managers might be thinking going into the next sort of game. So first game is a Tuesday 23rd of June, 6pm kickoff on Sky Sports, um, Leicester versus Brighton. So touched on it earlier, Leicester drew their first game away to Watford, um, spoke about Ben Chilwell's outrageous strike. Um, still no Pereira. Obviously, he picked up a long-term injury um, pre-COVID, and I'm not, I don't think he'll be playing again this season. But young JJ started um, at right back, and he, a young, promising player played, I believe, at Luton um, when they were in uh, League One. And he were well, both the fullbacks that during that campaign for Luton in League One were absolutely high flying and loads of energy. So I can see why um, sort of Leicester and, and me, even other clubs. Um, would have gone for those types of players because they're very sort of attacking players and how the game is um, in this modern modern day um, with the attacking fullbacks is sort of ideal for the way Leicester wants to play and how Brendan Rodgers wants his team to play as well. So 
you know, there's no no position, so no movement for Leicester in the table. They're still in third in the league. They're actually eight points above fifth place, so <clears throat> they've maintained their position. Um, the only difference is that fourth place, I've, Chelsea have clawed a couple of points back on them. Um, but nevertheless, they're in a strong position. They've got some nice fixtures coming up as well. Against Brighton in this game, you expect them to win this game. That move, we'll move on to Brighton now, actually. So they obviously had a fantastic result against Arsenal. I think they would have taken a point before the game as well, but for the fact that they scored in the 93rd minute as well, Neil Mopay scored a late goal. A um, couple of things I want to talk about here. Obviously, the main incident was between Leno and Neil Mopay. So if you guys haven't seen the incident, effectively a, a ball's been played through and Leno comes out, claims the ball, but Neil Mopay is pressurising him. As Leno sort of in the air to collect the ball his hands, his momentum potentially is going to take him outside the box. But as he's in the air, Neil Mopay sort of leans into him with his shoulder slash hands, um, puts him off balance, and then Leno lands really awkwardly and does some damage to, I'm not sure what part of the body, knee, ankle, that sort of area, and potentially could be out for a long period of time. So he got injured, had to be stretched off. He was really, really angry with Neil Mopay, <coughs> saying he didn't need to do it. Um, to be honest with you, I agree with Leno in the sense that he didn't need to do it, but it happens every game and um, I don't, I can't recall that type of incident happening in the past and a player getting injured, or some, a, a serious injury from it. So I think it's more of a freak incident. Um, and I don't blame Neil Mopo for doing it. I think it would happen in probably every single game or an instance where that scenario happens in the Premier League. I think every attacking player would probably do that, whether it's with a defender or a, a goalkeeper. I think they would do that. So I have no blame on on Neil Mopay's part. Obviously, to rub so in the wound of Arsenal, he ends up going going to score the winner because Arsenal actually thought he should have been sent off um, because of that incident. I don't think that maybe yellow card at push. Um, but obviously, he goes and scores a winner as well. So, like I said, it rubs so into the wound as well. Um, and then obviously that just moves Brighton that bit further ahead of um, above the relegation zone as well. So it puts them in a, a healthier position. Let's put it that way. Obviously, loads of loads of work for Graham Potter and his team to do going forward in the remaining sort of seven eight games they've got left. Um, then you've got the later game, which is Spurs versus West Ham. That's eight eight fifteen on the Sky Sports Channel. Um, so, as you've touched on, Spurs drew their first game one one against Man United. They would have. They were another team that, if they want to get to the Champions League, they probably need to get one beat and probably win seven. Seven, six to seven games um, and also then go and draw the rest of the games to have any hope of getting into the Champions League positions. So this wasn't ideal. They would have obviously penciled this game to be a W and to sort of get some momentum going. Um, so they still got slim chances of the Champions League but they were very much dependent um, and relying on other teams of dropping po points. On a positive note for, for Spurs... Kane was back, Son was back, Sissoko was back, Bergwijn was back, Bergwijn obviously scored the goal. Um, and the other sort of positive note as well that all the teams around them, bar Chelsea, um, actually, well, bar Chelsea and Wolves actually, um, sort of dropped points. So Sheffield dropped points, Man United dropped points, Arsenal dropped points, you know, there's all the sort of teams around them, uh, Leicester dropped points. So that's the sort of maybe consolation they can have and sort of might be holding on to some hope because of that. Um, and then in terms of West Ham, they um, had a poor result at home to Wolves. So I think the game was very much even, um, probably going into when, when Wolves made their substitutions with um, Adama Traore coming on and Neto coming on, but in particular Adama Traore. I think he made the difference. Fresh legs, obviously, he's rapid, um, and his, his crossing ability in the final third, in particular, has come on leaps and bounds. His just his end product in general has been different class uh, this season. I think he's, I think he's, the penny's dropped with him. He's found that bit more consistency, um, and obviously he set up the first goal, um, setting up Jimenez. So <clears throat> that was brilliant for, for. Um, Wolves' point of view, but obviously disappointing for West Ham. I think with with West Ham, they lack um, a lot of um, goal threat. They don't have someone who can really penetrate and look like they're going to score goals. I mean, I think Haller was missing in this game. Antonio played up front. 
Anderson doesn't look like the player he was from last season. You've got Lanzini who's sort of in and out of the team. Um, yeah, they, and you've got the young lad Bowen who's signed from, from Hull as well. Yeah, I do struggle for West Ham. I think, I do worry for them, sorry. And I don't know where their, their W's are going to come from, I'm totally honest. Um, one, one other note to sort of mention with West Ham, it's quite interesting to see um, from a, an English point of view, Young Declan Rice actually started the game at centre half, so he has been playing in centre midfield with um, club captain Mark Noble. But he actually, David Moyes decided to play him centre half, so that'll be interesting to see going forward if he um, continues to play in that position and if he evolves into that position and if that's where David Moyes sees him long term. Um, yeah, okay, moving on to the next game. So, Wednesday, the 24th of June, 6 pm kickoff, Sky Sports. We've got Manchester United versus Sheffield. U. So, obviously, United drew their first game 1-1 um, to Spurs. Bruno Fernandes scored a goal. Um, and you also, it was, well, the referee gave, the on-field referee gave another penalty and you thought United were going to go and nick, on, nick all three points. But um, rightly so, VAR overturned it. It wasn't a penalty. I don't think it was necessarily a dive from Bruno Fernandes either. I think he was anticipating some contact, so he kind of, leapt off the ground a little and then sort of landed to the ground so um, overall it was the right decision he he um, didn't get booked or anything like that and also the penalty wasn't given either so that was the right decision all the technology and the processes and all the officials sort of worked in that instance um, other positives in terms of United Rashford started again so it's really important for him to be back on a, on a personal note but also from Manchester United's point of view he sort of really was into his sort of coming to his own really Pre-COVID, sort of scoring quite a lot of goals uh, and being a real threat in that partnership with him and Martial sort of looked really, really promising. And then Pogba came on as well. He didn't start the game. and I think that was a right decision. I think if you look at the likes of McTominay, Fred, even Matic, um, them three in particular had a really, really good form um, before COVID-19. So I'm pleased that those guys were sort of and rewarded with their good form and Solskjaer giving them a bit of loyalty. Um, but he has come on and he has won the penalty. And I don't think any of our centre midfielders could do that bar Paul Pogba. And that is that is the positive side of Paul Pogba. He has got that sort of unpredictability about him. He's got that sort of um, je ne sais quoi, you know, as he's French about him as well. He can, he can produce something out of nothing. Um, a fair play to him. He did do well on it. One other thing to note as well, if you haven't seen the highlights, watch his diag of a pass. The technique is whew, frightening. I'll tell you what, the, the text on that is just outrageous. And that's another thing he can produce c compared to the other semifinals we've got, who I don't think they can. Um, not not to that sort of quick thinking and sort of decision making that quickly. Um, another thing as well, of course, you know, I drew. That keeps their sort of twelve games unbeaten um, run going as well, which is really really important uh, going into the sort of the rest of the season with the FA Cup around the corner as well. We touched on the ghost goal for Sheffield United. Obviously, they're going to be really disappointed with that. Um, if they miss out on European positions by one or two points, they're going to be really really annoyed. Um, but nevertheless, it's you know it's, it's a point for Sheffield. Um, another another clean sheet, another um, solid performance from Dean Henderson. Um, their second game they played Newcastle and this was a disappointing uh, result really for Sheffield a 3-0 defeat to Newcastle away from home there's a castle of errors from from their part um, centre back Egan picked up a second yellow so he's sent off and he'll miss this game against United um, who's left back Edna Stevens made an error for the opening goal which St. Maximin scored, that's going to be playing on his mind. And then the fact they just conceded two others as well, that's a, that's quite a big defeat for Sheffield. Considering they are a really, really solid outfit defensively, to lose three goals, um, especially in the manner that the goals came as well, would be disappointing. They didn't really look like they were going to ever sort of cause Newcastle any real problems. Um, so yeah, that was disappointing. So not the best sort of restart in terms of points tally. Certainly for Sheffield, one point out of a possible six. Nevertheless, they sort of remain in the European positions. Um, they haven't lost any ground on Arsenal, for example, actually gained. And then obviously with Spurs, they've actually just sort of 
maintain that distance with them as well. Moving on to Newcastle, Aston Villa then. Obviously just touched on there, Newcastle winning 3-0. Brilliant result. Um, finally, Joe Linton scored his second goal for the club. It's been a long time coming. Obviously there was big money spent. I think it was around, around £40 million, pound, I think it was. So big price tag. You expect maybe a bit more um, from him. But maybe, um, don't, don't get me wrong, it's quite a fortuitous uh, situation to, for them to be in in terms of play against sent off and then a catalogue of errors in terms of the goals before his goal. And so the game become easier for him. Um, and I think uh, Sheffield didn't look the same outfit by playing four at the back. Um, they look more exposed defensively. So therefore that allowed Joe Linton the space to sort of get into those positions and score the goal. But I'm just thinking maybe he might go on a bit of a run. And also maybe because the the crowd at St James's Park can sort of get on you as well a little bit. You know, if you miss a chance... They're hot on you, especially if you're the main striker who's come for a big dollar and you haven't scored for a long period of time. You know, every week if you'll keep missing them chances and they're gonna get on you. So it might be a blessing in disguise that actually that the crowd aren't there, they can actually um or he can actually perform. So um so that moves Newcastle all but safe, they're eleven points above the relegation zone. Um they should be fine from here on in. In terms of um, Aston Villa um, they remain in the relegation zone. They've lost, well, they drew their first game new new, and then lost their second game to Chelsea. Um, I do worry for Aston Villa. If I'm totally honest, um, it's, it was a good clean sheet to have, and that's been one of their big problems in the season before COVID nineteen. To get that clean sheet against Sheffield was was a good promising sign. But as soon as they conceded one, I wouldn't say the floodgates opened, but I think all them sort of negative feelings came back. Like, oh, we're we're vulnerable here. Or, well, we're in trouble kind of thing and I do worry for them and on top of that their key players like McGinn I know McGinn's been out for a while so you can maybe rule him out but Grealish doesn't really hit the ground running um, the goalkeeping situation is a bit of a problem for me and then young lad Keen Davis who actually did quite well in my opinion I think he, he always looks to run beyond um, he also he's quite good at linking up play as well he looked cute he looked clever but he's still young and he's He's new to the Prem, you know, he's only well, he's only started these two games for them and he has done quite well, but can you really rely on him to sort of score you the goals to get you out of trouble? I'm not sure. Then we go on to Norwich versus Everton, another six o'clock game on the Wednesday. This time it's on BBC. Um, so I mentioned on the last episode, on the um, pilot episode on the... Premier League preview show that Norwich had a player missing for the game due to COVID-19. That player was uh, Stiepelman, the German sort of number 10, if you like. So he will be available um, for selection for Daniel Farkas. That's one thing positive for Norwich. But the, the negative is the way they, they lost. It was, they lost 3-0, but it's the manner. They, they, re they lack a real defensive quality. And I think... I watched the game and I, I thought personally a lot of it was down to the fact that the two centre midfielders they lack a bit of discipline uh, they don't um, if one of them goes and wants to go and chase a ball or going to join in an attack the other player needs to make sure he's in a position that he can protect the two centre arts and I found that a lot of a lot of the time both centre midfielders were wondering and it was easy for on the transition for Southampton to drive at the two centre backs or drive into those into those sort of areas, it's just far too easy. And it's difficult for certain racks in that situation there. If you've got no certain fielders to protect you, yeah, then the game became really wide open. Obviously, you know, Danny Ings scores first, and Norwich are going to go for it. There's going to be more spaces. Goal two comes from Armstrong, Norwich are still going for it, and there's even more spaces. So, I do worry for Norwich. Um, I thought if they had any chance of surviving um, the, the drop, I felt like they needed to win. Well, certainly get four points from these two games, and that's obviously not possible now. Um, but I actually thought probably six points they probably needed because these on paper these were the two two games you would probably pencil and think oh, we can pick up wins here. But I fear for them if I'm totally honest. I think you know if you look at Everton's sort of strike force and what they can produce against what what in terms versus what Southampton did. You could argue Everton are more prolific, they're more deadly, they've got more options. So yeah, that, that could be quite worrying for Norwich. 
Moving on to Everton, obviously they drew the Merseyside derby nil-nil. They've helped delay the inevitable. That's one, that's one positive, um, certainly from a Man United point of view. Um, and it also keeps them in the European sort of positions. It gives them a slim chance um, of getting in there. They're probably in a very sl- similar position of um, Spurs. They probably need to go unbeaten on, a, on one hell of a run to sort of fight their way you know, into the European positions. One other thing to note as well, um, Carlo Ancelotti gave young uh, Gordon a debut. A little winger played on the left side. Probably play left and right, actually. Um, so it's good that sort of Ancelotti is willing to sort of give um, the academy a chance as well. Um, another game on the Wednesday, 6pm kickoff on BT Sport. We've got Wolves versus Bournemouth. Now, touched on it earlier, Wolves... Fantastic result away to West Ham. Jimenez and Neto scoring. Troy coming off the bench and being the, the difference, really. Um, but also, Doherty's continued in his form as well, you know, setting up Neto's goal and a hell of a strike, by the way. You know, technique was frightening. The power was irresistible for um, Fabianski. Just couldn't get near it. Um, and they've, they've really put them in a strong position. They've now, they've now gone joint uh, points with Manchester United. Um, five points outside the top four. And they could go on a strong run. They've got everyone fit um, and healthy and they've had their break. So I expect the Wolves winning this game um, and just because of everything, the positive side of it. And then you look at Bournemouth, I touched on it earlier. To me, they look like they lack fight. They look like, right, we're in, to me, like, you can admire it how in one sense, but you could also say it's naive in another sense. And it depends what way you look at it. And, how much of a, a belief and a, and a and a principle and a DNA that you you want to stick to, and or how, or how much of a DNA and a belief and a principle you want to um, change, if you like, or adapt. So what I mean by that is Eddie Howe always wants to play one way in terms of he wants the ball rolling across the deck, he wants to play between the thirds, he wants to play attacking football, he wants the the wide players to join, him, he wants his fullbacks to play, and that's the way he plays. And that's you admire him for that because that's worked from his that's they've got from League Two to League One to the champ and now in the Premier League I think third or fourth or fifth season in the Prem and that's worked for them but it looks like at this stage of the season that isn't working for them and that's hence why they're in the relegation zone. I just fear for them they I just feel like sometimes when you're near the bottom of the league, sometimes rolling your sleeves up and saying, Right, forget about playing football today, we're just gonna fight. We're going to win every first ball. We're going to try and win second balls. We're going to make sure we win our battles. Um, we're going to make sure we track our runners. We're going to make sure our attitude is correct. We make sure we do the warm up correctly. And all them sort of things. I don't get the sense that Eddie Howe would ever change his tactics in that sense. And I fear for them. So I feel like if if Bournemouth are going to win this game in particular, but even beyond that, staying in the division, Eddie Howe's pretty much said. We're doing it our way and we're going to do it the Bournemouth way and it'd be a hell of an achievement if we do it this way. And if we don't do it, and then we've at least gone down fighting the way that we believe in, which, again, you could admire Eddie Howe and, and the philosophy and the beliefs of the club. But on the other hand, you know, um, maybe a bit of naivety as well there. But um, nevertheless, you, I, me personally, I admire Eddie Howe for doing that. Um, but me personally, I probably would change my tactics because... I think you have to be adaptable in the Premier League. Certainly, I think you have to. Um, there's no, there's nothing wrong from veering away from your philosophy for a, a sort a short period of time in order to get results. Um, and I think that's what they need to do. Just moving on quickly as well. Really, really pleased to see David Brooks back for Bournemouth as well. He looked really sharp. You can't rely on him to be at his best immediately, but if they can get him, you know, the next two, three, four games back to anywhere near his best. That is the shining light for Bournemouth. That potentially his link up with Wilson and King and and Will um, Callum Wilson as well, they could all potentially go on and you know score a lot of goals and eventually get them out of the the relegation fight. But they're in a big fight. They're in a massive fight. Um, moving to the late game on the Wednesday, eight fifteen kick off on Sky Sports. We have Liverpool versus Palace. So Liverpool obviously drew their Merseyside derby. It's an okay performance. It wasn't wasn't. Brilliant. They had um, the team was interesting. Randy Robinson was had a slight injury. He did wasn't in the squad at all. Mo Salah apparently had a bit of an injury, but was okay to be on the bench and possibly play some minutes towards the end. 
Um, Joel Matip played at centre half ahead of Joe Gomez. Um, Minamuno was playing. Um, you had Naby Keita ahead of Gini Wijnaldum. So there was plenty of changes in there for Liverpool actually. Um, it was an okay performance. Um, I think as a combination of their first game back, um, the, the opposition, it being a derby, um, possibly what's on the line, albeit you know the inevitable will happen. Um, I think a lot of that sort of played a part in the okay performance. Um, in actual fact, we would probably argue that they probably could have lost the game with the chances that Everton had, certainly the last sort of 10 minutes or so with Tom Davies hitting the post, Calvert Lewin uh, bringing out a brilliant save from Allison and also missing a header from the from the um, corner afterwards as well, which he, you know, I think he would back himself to score that probably certainly seven, eight, nine times out of 10. Um, and then moving on to um, when they can potentially sort of win the league. So they still need five points to win the league. So potentially they could do it against Manchester City. So Liverpool win their game on the Wednesday and then Man City win their game. Um, whoever they're playing next, I believe it's Chelsea away. And then the next Premier League game, which is a week later for Manchester City on a Thursday night, it could happen that night there if Liverpool go and win their game. However, if Liverpool win their game... Um, and then Chelsea lose, I believe that's Liverpool's title, I'm, don't hold me to that, let me know in the comments if that's true or not, I'm not sure if my maths is correct in that sense, but let me know um, what you thought, or when you think Liverpool are going to win the league, if it's going to be this, this game week, or if it's going to be the next game week, or even beyond that. In terms of Palace, a brilliant um, result away from home, and like I touched on earlier, Bournemouth kind of made Palace look like Barcelona, the way they were popping the ball about and, you know, nice sort of crisp park passing. Benteke looked a handful as well. Actually moves Palace up to ninth in the league. And they still have an outside chance of European positions. They've kept, they've won the last four games and they've kept four clean sheets. So this actually be, the first goal in every game is obviously really, really important. But even more so for like a team under Roy Hodgson, they, they, um, the organisational skills and the way they, um, they just sort of their defensive block, the way they've organised it with Ray, Roy Hodgson and Ray Lewington, is very, very difficult to break a team down. And then on top of that, you've got the Zahars, you've got your Benteke, you've got your Andrew Ayew who can hit you on the counter. Um, so I think it'll be vitally important for if and when Liverpool score that first goal, how quickly can they do it and how that will potentially open up Palace a bit more earlier in the game and that could um, help Liverpool in that sense. But yeah, they probably have to go on a, a really strong run as well, maybe unbeaten to the end of the season if they want to get into the European positions. <coughs> yeah, then we've got Burnley versus Watford, so we're moving on to Thursday games now, 6 o'clock kick-off on Sky. Obviously Burnley had that huge, huge defeat to Manchester City last night. Um, they looked out of sorts defensively in the final third anyway. Um, they're missing obviously a lot of plays as well. Um, you know, they, I touched on it last episode. Their contractual situation for a lot of their players. There was a lot of rumours going, sort of going into the first round of games, sort of you know, before even the first sort of game on the Wednesday. And there was a lot of talk about it, but there was I did think it would be an issue. I thought, you know, Sean Dyche and the chairman they'll resolve it and it'll be absolutely be fine. But actually, it's materialised into a bigger situation and. From a, from a purely numbers point of view and a, a purely from a competition point of view in training, if you haven't got those players available and you're if you're part of the starting eleven, um, and you've got and you're playing against say a lot of the the twenty ones or the eighteens, with all due respect to the eighteens and twenty ones, generally speaking, they're not going to be good enough. They're going to be miles off it, and in training, because you know you you know if I was a Tarkovsky for example, not out on him at all, just for an example to name a player, if I was against him against a, a young 18-year-old, I think young Thompson come on um, towards the end of the game for Burnley. If he was playing against him you know, for a whole week in training and he's thinking, oh, this is easy, subconsciously he's going to come complacent and obviously you can't come complacent, especially against you know, an Aguero and a Jesus in this opposition against Manchester City. So I do think uh, this is a bigger thing than it. I didn't think it would materialise into this, but I do think it's a big thing and I think... Sean Dyche and the chairman need to resolve this situation. They've already they've been sort of the days leading up to this game that Burnley announced that Joe Hart's contract would not be renewed at all, so he wasn't in the squad. Um, 
they only actually named seven players on the bench, and two of them were goalkeepers. Um, so that that says a lot in itself, you know. If you can only name seven out of the the nine available to you, and two of them are goalkeepers, and the other three are well, three of the other five are all youngsters. There's only um, Eric Peters and another can't think off the top of my head who that was that were sort of notable senior players um, or first team players that are actually on the bench. So yeah, watch your space with Burnley in that situation because. I, Burnley were these teams who could have go on a, a run and get into these European positions. It's very, very tight from sort of twelve to to fourth in the league or fifth in the league. They could get into that. Um, they could have got into that uh, European position. They still can. Will take one hell of a run from now. But I just or I just worry if this if this situation doesn't um, resolve itself with Burnley, we could see a lot of bad results for them going forward, uh, and then it puts a downer and a dampener on their season. They could, sort of just go down to sort of 13, 14, 15 for the league and it turned into a really disappointing uh, season for them. Um, with Leicester, uh, well, sorry, with Watford, obviously they drew with Leicester 1-1. Dort, like I touched on earlier, Dawson scored a spe spectacular bicycle kick. Kept, keeps them outside the relegation zone. And the only player that was missing for Leicester, uh, I keep calling him Leicester, sorry, Watford, was Gerard Delafoe, who picked up a bit of an injury before COVID, so he's obviously going to miss, I believe, all the... Um, remaining games of Project Restart um, so yeah it'd be interesting to see how I think this is a very much a game that probably be played like this in the, in the midfield won't be involved too much I can see Talkowski and Ben Mee playing into Rodriguez or Vidra or, or if Wood or Barnes are back and then likewise if Dawson's playing or Cabaselli's playing they're just going to go into Dini and then Decore's going to pick up seconds and you'll get Saar and, and Pereira joining in as well so I can't see this game being one for the purists. I, I can't see a lot of midfielders sort of dictating play. I think this is one that very much will be played in the air and seconds will might be key um, to the game. Um, moving on to the second game, um, well, another game on the Thursday, which is um, which is a six o'clock kickoff on Sky Sports. Southampton versus Arsenal. So this will be uh, Southampton's second game. They won their first game 3 0 away to Southampton. Brilliant result. Danny Ng scoring, Stuart Armstrong scoring, Nathan Redmond scoring. And just pushes them that further up the table and above the relegation zone. Um, probably say they only need one more win to. I mean, they might be mathematically safe now, but obviously we're not going to. Sorry, let me rephrase that. It might turn out that the amount of points they've got now is enough to keep them in the division. Obviously, they're not mathematically safe, but. I think one more win for Ralph and his team will <clears throat> make him feel comfortable and, and yeah, be sure that they're going to be in the division for next season. So the only they can get that, the better. And traditionally in this fixture, Southampton have done quite well against Arsenal. They're certainly at, um, at Southampton in a way. So yeah, this fixture. Um, and Arsenal don't particularly like going down to St Mary. So this could be an awkward fixture for them. Um, for Arsenal, obviously this is going to be their third game. Have lost both their games, losing to Brighton two one, and then obviously Man City the first game. First game, Meza Ozil was well. His he was his his omission was a strange one. Um, I'm not sure the reason behind it. Um, but then he was back in the bench for the second game and and didn't come on in that game. We touched on the Leno incident earlier. Um, don't need to discuss that any further. David Luiz obviously picked up the red card. He's given away a penalty. He's made errors, um, errors galore from Twanisby. I mean, I touched on um, his uh, red card situation. He's picked up four red cards for Arsenal this season already. He's only been there for three quarters of the season. And he's also, so he's picked up two red cards this season and given away four penalties this season. Um, so it doesn't look very good for David Wes, um, particularly for him. <clears throat> and then... With Arsenal and Arteta, I believe the direction that he'd be going in, I think he's going to start giving a lot more younger players opportunity. You know, if you look at the starting lineup against Arsenal, for example, they started with Mari, um, I'm not sure how old he is, but relatively young centre half. You had Kieran Tierney, relatively young. Gwendozi, Saka, Nketia, Willock. There's a lot of young players in there. I think that's the direction they're going to be going in. So I think it's imperative for them to. 
they obviously won the W as soon as possible, but they can't go three games, three losses. Um, they need something from this game. <clears throat> Personally, I think the way Arsenal are going to play, they're going to go for it. That could play into Danny Ings' hands. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that game goes. And then moving on to the last game of the round, or round two, which will be game week 31 plus, <clears throat> which is Chelsea versus Manchester City, a heavyweight game. Two heavyweights, you know, going head to head in this game. It's eight fifteen kickoff on BT BT Sport. So just one thing that's sort of not nothing to do with sort of what's happened on the pitch so far. But Chelsea have all but signed Timo Werner. It was subject to a medical, so they've met the release clause of I believe it's fifty four million pounds, um, and he'll be joining them <coughs> potentially in. Well, I think the deal will go through possibly in July, but whenever the window opens, and that's yet to be decided. Obviously, with everything going on, um, UEFA needs to come to an agreement to decide when all the windows and stuff are going to be open and, and close for all the European leagues. So, not sure exactly when he'll be joining the, the joining the team. But obviously, just going to football matters himself. A brilliant win, um, two one away to Aston Villa. Good, showed actually really good character um, to sort of turn it around in the second half. They actually played really well in the first half. Uh, they looked neat and tidy, especially in the middle third, which they they've done all season. Really pleased that Loftus Cheek was, you know, back fit, started the game, played a good hour or so, um, to get minutes and, and into his lungs and legs is really, really promising. And he could be a key player going forward for them. Um and just moves them five points clear of fourth place or fifth place in the league. So <clears throat> sort of just and edges them a bit closer to Leicester as well. So that's worth noting as well, you know, if you know, Leicester's form sort of dips and they're they're ready to pounce and sort of take over them. Um, and then with Manchester City, they've obviously started the season or re you know, restart the season in imperious form with 3 0 and a 5 0 win, 8 goals, 0 goals conceded. Um, three goals for Foden, a couple of goals for Mares, um, who also scores Sterling, lots of different goal scorers, David Silva. So they've looked imperious, and I think <clears throat> be interesting to see how this game goes actually because Chelsea, I, I thought in the reverse structure of this, Played really, really well. Actually, probably the better team up until City scored. But obviously, as soon as City scored, then they sort of come into their own a bit more. So I'm interested to see how this game goes. And, you know, there's a lot on the line. Obviously, Manchester City want to try and delay the Liverpool um, title win as long as possible. So they'll be going all out to win this game. And regardless of the situation, they would be doing the same. Any team under Guardiola does do that. Um, so, yeah, it'd be very interesting to see... From a tactical point of view as well, um, you know there's, there's a lot of good technical play, especially in the central area with lots of Jorginho, Kovacic, Loftus Cheek, um, and others as well. You know, and down the sides you've got Willian and, and Pulisic. Then you look at Manchester City with De Bruyne, David Silva, Bernardo, Mares, Rodri, or Gundogan. Yeah, you know, there's a there's a there's a ray of talent in that central area and even wide areas as well where the game probably be won in them in situations. Right, guys, that actually concludes episode two of the Premier League Appetizer show. Leave a like, leave a comment, leave some comments with regards to what you think when Liverpool are going to win the league. Will it be this round of fixtures? Will it be next round? Um, what you want to see maybe more of on the channel. And yeah, like, subscribe and leave a comment and we'll see everyone on the next episode.